The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be, and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and plagues. And there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord. Please be seated. The texts this morning all have one thing in common. They all talk about a time in the future that will be different from the time the listeners were living in and, and the time that we're living in. In the reading from the second letter to the Thessalonians, there are people who have lost sight of the teaching of Christ. The new Christians in Thessalonica were taught to believe that the second coming of Christ would happen in their lifetime. Some of them, apparently, adopted an attitude of waiting and idleness, perhaps assuming they need not continue to labor for food if any day now all their needs will be met. But their behavior is placing an undue burden on others in the community. This text has often been misunderstood and used to chastise those who are unemployed. In regard to the verse, anyone unwilling to work should not eat. Let us not confuse the word unwilling with unable. The commentaries I read were all clear that this letter specifically concerns matters within the Christian community. The problem being addressed here is how Christians are treating one another, not how hungry people in the world will be fed. In the reading we heard this morning from Luke's Gospel, Jesus spoke of a day in which the stones of the temple would be thrown down, 
not one stone left upon another. In other words, it will be as if their whole world has been turned upside down. Life as they know it will never be the same. It's no wonder that those speaking with Jesus asked him when this would happen and what signs would indicate it was about to take place. Wouldn't we all like to have a heads up or some warning before something like that happened? Jesus said there would be wars and insurrections. Nations will rise against nations and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes famines and plagues. The people would be betrayed by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, arrested and persecuted, put to death and hated. It sounds to me a lot like the headlines we hear in the news every day. Are we to take that as a sign that we are living in the end times? that Christ just might be coming in our lifetime? I'd like to consider this question from two perspectives this morning. The first is scriptural. Now, it's very common for us as humans to listen to what someone has said, but only hear part of it. Perhaps the most startling pieces or perhaps the parts that confirm what we might already expect to be true. But I want to look at some of the other things Jesus said in this text this morning and consider that they may be equally important. First of all, Jesus was quite vague about the time frame. Not only did he list things that had been already happening in the times of his original audience, he also said, before all that occurs, there are all these other things that will happen. Before, all these things have already happened. And they've been happening for over the last 2,000 years. So perhaps all of these signs may happen before Christ returns again. But it has never meant that Christ will return within days of these things happening, or years, or even centuries. Jesus also said four things that might be easier for us to overlook with all the talk about war and destruction. I'm going to reread a few of the verses for you, but these are the things I want you to watch out for. Beware that you are not led astray, do not go after false teachers. Do not panic. And do not make up your minds to prepare your defense in advance. Feel free to, to read along with me if you'd like. It's on page six of your bulletin, starting with verse seven. They asked him, teacher, when will this be? And what will be the signs that is it about to take place? And he said, beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first but the end will not follow immediately. So it seems clear from this list that a preoccupation with the end time scenario is not what Jesus is hoping for us. The injunctions Jesus gives suggest that patience and discernment are characteristics that Christian communities should be cultivating. Just as believers cannot prepare a timetable and check off events and know when to anticipate the end, so they ought not spend time in anxiety about the future. For Jesus also said this, starting in verse 13. Well, I'm going to start, let's start with verse 12. 
But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify, an opportunity to witness to others. He goes on to say, so make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance. We don't need to be worrying now about how to defend ourselves in the future. For I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. It's not our words that will win in the end. It's Christ's words. And at the last verse, not a hair of your head will perish, but your endurance, by your endurance, you will gain your souls. So perhaps instead of reading the world events of the past or the present as signs or portents of something yet to come, we can see these events as opportunities to witness to others to grow stronger in our faith, to go stronger in our service to others. Now I want to look at this from a more theological perspective. If these are the signs that indicate Christ's return, signs like earthquakes and tsunamis, signs like the war on Ukraine, or the world hunger crisis, or a global pandemic, or refugees fleeing their homelands, wildfires and droughts throughout the world, mass shootings in our schools. If these are signs that tell us Christ will be returning, then we must recognize that Christ has already been returning over and over again from the beginning of time. For it's easy for us to look at the world around us and think that things have never been this bad before. But these issues are not unique to our day and age. Ask anyone who has been affected by the AIDS epidemic or the Great Depression or the horrors of World War II and the Holocaust. Or look at the accounts of the early American settlers with the diseases and hunger they faced, the horror inflicted on the Native Americans, or the tragedies of the early American slave trade. Look all around the world and go back even further in time, and there is more of the same, wars, and insurrections, earthquakes, famines, and plagues. But for as many examples as we have of the signs of Christ's return, we have at least that many examples of Christ present and at work in the world around us. Through organizations like Episcopal Relief and Development, and the Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, Habitat for Humanity. Through individuals like Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, and Mother Teresa, Alexander Fleming, Nelson Mandela, and Desmond Tutu, and countless others whose names we will never know. We can even look closer to home through the mission outreach at St. Barnabas to organizations like Family Promise, Angel Tree, and Project School Bell. The ministries at St. Barnabas, like Community of Hope, the Order of St. Luke, and the grief counseling that we do here. In the service of holy baptism, when we renew our baptismal covenant, we promise, with God's help, to seek and serve Christ in all persons because Christ dwells in each and every one of us. When we offer thanksgiving over the water, 
We proclaim that through the water of baptism, we are buried with Christ in his death, and by it we share in his resurrection. Christ has returned through us. Christ is here among us. And Christ is calling us to do the work of the kingdom. Create community. Oppose injustice. Work for peace. And make a place for the excluded. When we do the work we are called by Christ to do, we help bring the kingdom of God to earth as it is in heaven. We say in Eucharistic prayer A, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Perhaps we should be saying, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again and again and again and again. What these three readings have in common is that they speak of a present reality, including the suffering and trials of those living at the time in which these texts were written, and they speak of a hope for the future in which the kingdom of God is realized right here on earth. We need to stop waiting for Christ to come again and realize that Christ is already here. Forget the bumper sticker that says, Jesus is coming, look busy. (laughs) And adopt the attitude that Jesus is here, get busy. We need to live our lives now as if these were the end times and go about doing the work that Christ has called us to do. We are to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those in prison, and love those who have no one else but us to love them. We may continue eagerly awaiting Christ's physical return to earth in the final days, but we must not forget that Christ is already here. Christ will come again, and Christ is here now and Christ will come again. He has come in glory, he will come again in glory, and his kingdom will have no end. So let us go and do the work Christ has called us to do, ease the suffering of those around us. We don't have to go far. There is work to do right here in these walls. There is work right to do do right in our backyard in our communities. Christ is among us. Stop waiting for Jesus to return and do the work for us. Go and be Christ in the world today.